Welcome everybody. I'm here in the fireside room at Vancouver Unitarians with a couple of other people. And we're using this fancy schmancy owl machine, not to be confused with our whole life sexual education program. <laughs> and we've got a giant monitor here so we can see all of you loud and clear. And theoretically the owl will mean that if I'm talking, you'll see me as one of the major people. And at the top, you see people coming and going, et cetera. <laughs> so we're not quite at 1230. So if you want to uh, say your name and what congregation you're at and say hello, uh, please do. Um, here at UC, we have. <coughs> Hello. I'm seeing if it works and it actually switches to me. Ha. I'm wondering what people are saying. Oh, yeah, there. I'm waving. Hello. <laughs> Vivian over here. Hello. <laughs> That's kind of cool. So we got Mary Lane, Vivian, Elizabeth Murdoch. Elizabeth. Yeah. Edwin Bussey. <laughs> I'm not on the screen, but I'm here. You are on the screen. There it's just a timing. Yeah, at the, at the top, when you speak, it moves oh. to you. With the okay. yellow band in the and Nina Wong here, and Mary Bennett. Hey, I'm happy people are doing this. Not very much, I'm glad we got two Mary, three Marys. Uh -huh. Three yeah. Marys in the room. Three Marys are up in the same place. Yeah. Same job. This is very true. <laughs> like-minded Marys. I kind of had a mess with you. Like-minded Marys. It's a good little group. <laughs> like-minded Marys. Did everybody get a copy of our no, July. Yeah, it could be. I got Thank you so much. Make a silly remark by Kale Mary. I got a in the bathroom. Oh, you look there. She's in the bathroom. That is really satisfying. Good realization. That looks awfully familiar. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's 1231, so I'm going to get started because that's my reputation. So welcome everybody. Um, our little um, Metro Vancouver Zero Waste team has been planning this event for quite some time. So it's pretty exciting to finally uh, be here with you and seemingly having the technology working just fine. So that's a great relief and we're recording it. So there are some people that can't be here today, but they were interested in watching it at some other point. So that's all good. So I'm going to read some words from Joanna Macy from her book, Active Hope, to uh, get us grounded into the feeling of this event. <clears throat> Active hope is not wishful thinking. Active hope is not waiting to be rescued by some savior. Active hope is waking up to the beauty of life on whose behalf we can act. We belong to this world. The web of life is calling us forth at this time. We've come a long way and are here to play our part. With active hope, we realize that there are adventures in store, strengths to discover and comrades to link arms with. Active hope is a readiness to discover the strengths in ourselves, and in others, a readiness to discover the reasons for hope and the occasions for love. So as we go through, each member of our team will introduce themselves a bit, maybe say a little bit about what their congregation is doing in the area of 
zero waste, and then they have a topic to discuss. And so first up, we have Teresa Morton talking about Plastic Free July Eco Challenge. Over to Teresa, and I'll put us on mute. Okay. So hello, everyone. I'm Teresa Morton and a member of Beacon Unitarian Church. And Beacon has had a two-year focus on plastics in terms of zero waste. And every summer, the People's Eco Challenge, based in Portland, Oregon, runs a special event called the Plastic Free July. Now, the Metro Van Unitarians have a team, as well as the North Shore Church. It is a team event, or it can be a personal commitment which tracks our actions and shows the impacts from our collective efforts. There are six categories of actions, food, personal care, community, pets, family, and lifestyle. You can commit to one, several, or many actions to carry out over the month. Some are one-time actions, while others are daily actions. Action suggestions, of which there are 70, include advocacy, learning, sharing, and personal habit changes. For example, I selected, when available, I will purchase clothing made with natural fibers, such as cotton, linen, or wool, rather than synthetic fibers. And actually, the last piece of clothing I bought, a dress, was made from bamboo. I also get credit for actions which I already take, such as, <laughs> such as using loose leaf tea, because so many of the tea bags contain plastic. The Plastic Free July Eco Challenge is a great opportunity to review our plastic usage, learn about alternatives, build new habits, and contribute to our collective impacts. So I hope you check it out and sign up and enjoy participating. Thank you. Great, thank you, Teresa. And so we're going to go over to South Fraser Conservation with um, Donnie. <clears throat> Hello, um, I'm Donelda Rose from South Fraser Unitarian, also known as Donnie. And um, today I'm going to be sharing a little bit of um, information on growing our own food uh, to avoid a lot of the plastic clamshell packaging bags, twist ties, all those little bits and pieces that come with um, plastic that we buy at the supermarket. Um, and of course, growing our own food uh, is, saves energy in many other ways, transportation, and um, it's also much more, um, it's fresher, so it's more nutritious. So there are a lot of advantages to growing our own food. And I know Many people are not able to have a large garden, but even it's like the, the plastic challenge, even doing one thing helps. You could grow a pot of chives or lots of people grow tomatoes in pots. And I recently found out that um, a good companion, well, a good companion with tomatoes is basil. So you can get two for one in one pot. A lot of people have strawberry pots and a good um, companion with strawberries I recently found out is lettuce. So again, another two for one in one pot. Other alternatives, if you don't have space to garden yourself, you could talk to family or friends and share a space or there are allotment gardens increasingly in, um, the city that uh, often unfortunately have a wait list, but uh, they are increasing. Another thing that you might consider if you live close to a school, a lot of schools have 
have school gardens now. And um, as a former teacher who had a school garden, summertime was always a bit of a challenge because um, the gardens kept growing, of course, in the summertime, and it was a challenge to keep them tended and watered. So you could volunteer to help with um, the gardens in the summer or even help with the gardening, volunteer to help with the gardening throughout, throughout the, the school year. Uh, so there, there are a number of alternatives if you don't have your own garden space. Um, my partner Monty uh, asked a neighbor down the alley if he could garden, put in a garden box outside the fence in the alleyway and um, the neighbor said, sure, I won't, have to, I won't have to weed eat it if you do that. And um, we get potatoes and currants and rhubarb and quite a bit of food in a small space. So just it's, it's the sort of the fourth or the first um, R in the recycling, um, reduce, reduce, recycle and reuse um, the rethink just you know, think about how you can find a spot. Some of the things that have really increased my interest in gardening is learning about urban farming. And um, I don't know if everybody can see, I have this urban farm book, which is backwards, <laughs> but it's called the Urban, urban Farm Handbook by Annette Cottrell and Joshua McNichols. And it talks about a lot of the things you can do in urban spaces. Another thing that really impacted my interest in gardening in small spaces and um, thinking about the soil was a, a YouTube or a Netflix documentary called The Biggest Little Farm. Mm -hmm. And if, if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. It's uh, very entertaining and uh, just it really changed my thinking about gardening. There's also a lot of information online that's easy to access, uh, a lot about companion planting and um, there's, it's, it's really surprised me how much we can actually grow in a small space. And we started small with, with just a few with a very small area and we've added pots and it's it's just it's quite amazing how it grows and I have one more thing to share with you today a good news story that um, my son sent to me it's out of Leamington Ontario and it's about uh, a producer that pack that packages long English cucumbers in plastic. And they have, have stopped doing that. And they use um, a coating made from, from food products uh, instead of plastic. And when they package more than one, they just put a paper band around it. And um, when I bought cucumbers with just the the long English cucumbers with just a little bit of plastic on it didn't look like much. But in this, um, it was a CBC uh, learning team uh, out of um, Leamington, Ontario. And if you Google that, I'm sure you could find it. But in the, in the film about it, they had this huge roll of plastic that was just going over and over and over and, and coating, um, packaging all the cucumbers. So it's another one of those um, awareness um, actions that's happening and it seems to be happening more and more now. So uh, I wish you all happy gardening. Um, if you're able to incorporate that in your living space or neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donnie. Donelda. And uh, next we have the North Shore Unitarians, uh, Barb and Shelley. And I'm not sure who's talking first. Barb. 
Okay. Um, I am unmuted, right? Um, can everybody hear me? Right. Yes. Great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit about the North Shore Unitarians, and we have an environmental action team that's been going for two years, and um, we've actually been involved in a, a number of actions on climate change over the years, but this is a team that we've sort of more formalized recently, and uh, we were delighted to be invited to join the Metro group and love the idea that we came up with uh, under the umbrella of zero waste uh, plastics. So we definitely have a lot of plans for focusing on plastics today. I'm just gonna share two items. And one of those is on cleaning products. Um, because time is tight, I'm not going into a lot of detail of why they are bad, but I think most of us know that they are loaded with chemicals that are very harmful for the environment. <laughs> The second part of that is I look at it and say, why are we even buying things? And I'm just gonna screen share with you a document. Um, and open it again. This one. Um, on the left is a picture I took recently, and uh, it's only a portion of the uh, shelf in my local grocery store um, with cleaning products. I can't and see your screen, uh, you're Barb. Not I don't know if it? others. I'm not. I don't know. Am I alone in that? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I press screen share. Let's see what's happening. Okay. Maybe that and share. That better? Yes. Something happened. <laughs> yeah. Right. There you go. I forgot to click share. So I'm just saying, look at this on, it's on my left, so I'm assuming it is. And on the right is my repertoire of cleaning products. And one of those is really not necessary. It's for dusting, but it's got a little bit of olive oil in it. And I like it because it sort of helps to prevent dust accumulating. And uh, I just think, why are we buying all of these? There's a product for just about anything. Um, very specialized that really none of them are very good. We have to also watch the fact that there are a lot that call themselves green or environmentally friendly and really look carefully at the ingredients because um, often they're not, or maybe a portion of it is. So, um, but really the bottom line is it's very easy to make your own cleaning products. These are glass spray bottles. And uh, so they are refillable if you want to even go somewhere and purchase a product. But when I think of the ease of making it, I think even why do that? So one of the key ingredients in a lot of cleaning products in here is, is Castile soap. And it's... Um, Available, I buy mine at Dr London Drugs, but I think it's available in a lot of places. And Dr. Bonner is, Bronner is the um, um, name of the product that I buy, but I believe there are other Castile soap products out there too. So I uh, have an all-purpose cleaner that's six cups of water and a quarter cup of liquid Castile soap. And if you want to use essential oils, you can. You should really research some of essential oils are not environmentally friendly. But I buy um, a soap that already is slightly scented. I actually have mint in mine and there's just a tiny scent. I'd love to try the lemon. My uh, bottle is 946 milliliters. It is a plastic bottle. So I am thinking I will write them and say, can't you switch to glass? Um, but it lasts me probably about two years. So it's um, a really good deal, less than $20. I use this as my everyday cleaner in the kitchen, the bathroom, and I, during COVID especially, I was doing all my door handles and it's just really easy to use. And as far as I can tell, it cleans beautifully. So other uses are wiping the inside of a refrigerator, uh, cleaning a toilet bowl. I just put a little of this, spray it into my toilet bowl, let it sit for however long and then use a toilet bowl brush to clean it. Um, you can also use it on your shower stalls and uh, chrome handles. Um, Vivian, I think, are you going to do a link 
in the chat so that people can have a copy of this. She muted. Anyway, I hope she is. Um, another product that I use is vinegar and water. Um, basically, it has replaced uh, Windex, which is a really bad product for the environment. Um, and you just simply combine equal parts vinegar and water and again, store in a glass spray bottle. And I, if I'm doing windows, I do use newspaper, but otherwise I strictly use a cloth. I spray it and wipe it with a cloth. And for mirrors and like my glass shower, it works just perfectly. So again, it's good for cleaning windows, mirrors, shower doors, stainless steel finishes. It's also actually really good for grease spots on stove, microwave, and even my cupboards um, works perfectly. One cleaner that I was really quite excited about, I just found out about this last year, or this year, well, I guess last year, um, was using a baking soda paste to clean my oven and, and microwave. And it works really well as well. If you have racks that are quite dirty, then what I do is take them out, um, put them on newspaper, and um, then just cover them with this mixture overnight. And then in the morning, it's really easy to clean it. I would stress if you're using this is to make sure you have a paste. Sometimes I've not had quite a paste and it's a little harder to clean up afterwards if you don't. But if you have that, it works really, really well. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with David Suzuki's um, foundation's Queen of Green. They have a really neat uh, two page um, sheet on different ways you can make clean products. That's where I actually get my formula for uh, dusting. Um, and there is a link on this uh, sheet that we'll make sure that you get access to in the chat. The second thing I was going to talk about is um, cornstarch containers. Um, many of you may have, if you're order takeout at all, or um, yeah, basically found out about cornstarch containers. And in my area, they're using them quite a bit. And at first I was really excited about that, that they were moving from plastics or even aluminum to, to um, the cornstarch containers. And when I researched it, early articles on the internet say it's compostable, great, they advertise it as compostable, but is another, just a picture of what cornstarch containers may look like. Um, what I found out in my research is that if you look really, do a deep dive, you'll find out, sure, they are compostable, but only in facilities that are designed at high temperatures and humidity control to compost them. Currently, there is nowhere in, in fact, I don't even think in BC, I've said the lower mainland, but I talked to Recycling BC and the research and the um, BC Council, Recycling Council, and, um, found out that they have no facilities available and they currently don't have any plans to build facilities that can compost corn starch containers. So really important to know they are not compostable through our green bin programs. They are also not good for home composting because they do require humidity and control and temperatures to, um, to work. And they also create more acidity in your home compost. So not a good idea to put them in your home compost. They are not recyclable. And in fact, could affect the collection for those of you who have curbside, if you put something that's not recyclable in your, um, I've got, I think it's a blue bin, not green. Um, they can only go in the garbage. And I've read mixed sort of messages. Some, a couple of sites said they take as long as plastic bags to decompose. Some say they just take a long time. So I'm not sure of the actual facts on that. But my conclusion is try to find a restaurant that will let you bring your own containers or many of them now have uh, container programs where you put a deposit down and use their container and return it and get your deposit back or reuse it. I would really love to see all of us involved in a campaign to inform our local residents of the facts of cornstarch containers, because I think they are definitely falling under the 
greenwashing category where they think they're doing a good thing. So as in many things, we really have to look at what are the facts and definitely the societies got on the green wagon, which is really, really great, but there's a lot of uh, false information out there that is unfortunately people are trying to sell their product when in fact it's not a good environmental substitute. Um, I would really suggest that uh, you, uh, along with our team, are planning to look at what really is, what's the best practices with respect to uh, containers, compostable, and um, you know, what are really the most sustainable alternatives. So that's my portion, and I will ask Shelley to pick up on some really neat hints of products we can use. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, thanks, Barb. I just feel like I'm going and cleaning my house this afternoon. I feel inspired by that. Um, I'm, you can hear me? Yeah, yeah. So one of my personal challenges in the last few years is when I'm having to go to buy products that I need, I try to find the best product, the one that's the easiest on the planet, uh, so to speak. And I have found some really good ones and I have found some that are not so good too. Um, and when I find really good ones, I usually buy extra and I, I pass them to my friends to help them change their thinking and look for products that are easier on the environment too. So I think the very best one I have found, and I think a lot of you might already be using them, is the laundry strips. So instead of having the big jug, plastic jug of laundry detergent that ends up in your blue bin, which doesn't actually probably get recycled in the end. These little laundry strips, you just tear them in half and throw it in the water and it turns into laundry soap in the water. And it comes in a very light uh, paper container. I find they wash just as well as any other laundry detergents I've ever used. And um, so yeah, I'm totally committed to laundry strips now. And I think I have a lot of friends committed to them too. Um, another thing that I've been using for quite a few years are produce bags. They come in all different shapes and sizes. I think if I were to buy them again, I'd probably find one that was made out of a more natural, um, maybe find something that was cotton. But anyway, I'll be using these for a very long time. They, they go in the wash and then just put them back with your grocery bags and they're there for the next time. Um, I use the beeswax products, a beagle, I think was the first one. This is called bee kind, B-E-E -E kind. And it, you just put them over a bowl of leftover food and into your fridge and saves having to use any kind of plastic. So that's been a good product too. Um, as far as hand soaps, I used to look for different ways to refill the, the pump. And I've now just given up with the pumps and I've gone back to just using bars of soap at home. Um, but before I actually found the bar, decided to go back to the bars of soap, I found all kinds of interesting um, items. There's a lot of small companies trying to do the right thing. And I was always testing them out. And one of them was this company called ET. And so their product comes in a cardboard box. There's no plastic involved. And then the, 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 uh, the soap is inside this beeswax container and you just snip off the top, pour it into your, um, your pump, your soap pump and mix it with water. And, but to me, I don't know. I, it, I thought it was an interesting idea but I haven't continued to use it. I will use these up of course, but I won't, don't think I'll buy it again. Um, I'm not quite so sure about these. They, they go, they're made from some kind of rubber silicone. I'm not sure. They come in all different sizes and you just put them over like this one here fits over the can of cat food perfectly. And it saves from having to use anything else to cover up cans. Um, I find a whole bunch of uses for them and I don't think they'll ever wear out. So I'll be using them for, forever. There's all kinds of products like that. These kinds of things can sit right on top of a, a bowl that goes into your fridge. Don't have to use the plastic wrap. Oh, another product that is, I think, really good. I don't know if everybody has had the same results. This is shampoo and conditioner. 
So it eliminates that plastic bottle of shampoo and conditioner and you just rub it on your head. And uh, then you do the same thing with the conditioner. It lasts it's a long, long time. And then when it's gone, there's nothing to recycle or throw in the garbage. It's, you just get another block of shampoo. Now, just recently, and I, so I don't know how good these are yet, but I found these little, it's in a glass jar. They are in a glass jar. They look like mints, but it's toothpaste. And you chew on them, it foams up in your mouth, and then you just put in your toothbrush and brush away. When you've been through all your little pellets, you take the glass jar back to the store. I got this at um, the source, Bulk Foods, and they refill the jar with more. So again, nothing ends up in the garbage. Toothpaste um, tubes are like, you can't recycle them at all as far as I know. I know there's other natural products you can use, baking soda and so on, but this just makes it easy for me. Another product I had just bought, I, I don't know yet whether it works, but it's deodorant and it's an uh, a cardboard container rather than the plastic container. So I'm hoping that that works out well. And the only, the last thing I wanted to talk about was something I have, I read about, and I don't know if it's in Canada yet, but those clamshell containers that we buy, or sometimes we have to buy um, vegetables in, just make me crazy. It's really hard to escape them. But I read about this farmer in California somewhere in the US anyway, and she, she grows um, cherry tomatoes. So she developed these little cardboard boxes that she uses instead of the plastic clam shells. And they, they're, they look like they're quite lovely. They have great big slats in them. So if you're the consumer, you can see the, the, what's in them and you can actually open up the lid and look, make sure that it's not all moldy or whatever. And um, they just seem like such a great idea. Get rid of those plastic clamshells. So I'm going to start encouraging the grocery stores I go to to look this up and see if they can find out, you know, maybe encourage their farmers where they get their produce to switch to something like this. In the, um, the chat at the bottom, I'll um, write in the name of this company and you might want to pass it on to any grocers that you know as well or farmers or I don't know. I've just started on this one, but I'm excited about it. Somebody is trying to get rid of clamshells. So that makes me really happy. So those are just some of the products I have found that I feel is an improvement over, you know, anything that's made with plastic. And I'll keep looking. So I'm looking forward to hearing ideas from other people too. And uh, I'll stop there. Mary, back to you. I think I'm frozen. Was I just frozen the whole time? No. Um, you were fine. Oh, good. <laughs> it, it froze just as I stopped there. I thought, oh, no. Okay. Maybe Mary's frozen. Teresa, can you just step in? Yeah. Try, try again, Diane. I was on mute. Oh, um, I don't have a lot to offer except that I make my own yogurt, which mm. is very, very easy to do. And of course, put it in glass containers instead of plastic. All you really need is milk and um, culture. <laughs> Yeah, and years ago in the whole earth catalog years, we were can you all hear? Yes. We were it, it provided with uh, a recipe for yogurt, and I did that years ago mm -hmm. and made granola and all kinds of cleaning products. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's out of uh, out of top of mind. So I've started again and it it tastes so great because it doesn't come in plastic. And then I'm just keeping a, uh, a log um, of what I'm doing just to stay um, up there because I'll forget so easily. Like, for example, yesterday I went to Save on Foods. I took a plastic bag. I got 
I got popcorn out of the bulk food department and put it in my own plastic bag, tied it up so I didn't need to tie, little tiny things like that. Um, and loose leaf tea, again, uh, I have tried not to use uh, tea bags, but using loose leaf tea. Simple, but uh, uh, keeping track. So trying to add those, those details every day. Just to ask really quickly, um, during COVID, my supplier for culture disappeared. Oh, that thing is for There's no culture. So where do you get your culture? Well, I just start with. Oh, you do oh, that. Yeah. I can't think that way. I tried. Mm -hmm. so, well, we'll, we'll have a discussion at the end. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Because, yes. At the end of the talk. Yeah. Okay, yeah. next is Teresa again, who's going to talk about um, uh, talking to your local and national grocery stores. Okay, so uh, part of Beacon's Plastics Initiative was to visit local grocery stores, asking managers about initiatives to reduce the plastics used in food packaging. We were cordially received However, the local stores had little say in the chain's policies. So we sent letters to the head offices of food suppliers. This was one of our more effective actions since we received good letters in reply and learned about initiatives being taken by the chains. Mary has included one of our letters on the Google Drive resources to give you a starting point if you want to follow this tactic. <clears throat> Excuse me. In our letters, we mention who we are and why we're concerned about plastics. We just included a sentence or two about plastics pollution, direct risks to animal populations, for example, and the fact that grocery shopping is one of the most difficult areas to limit or eliminate plastic packaging. We gave an acknowledgement of the benefits of plastic packaging. It's light, it's strong, it's durable, and it provides protection from contamination. And we did that so that the um, stores wouldn't just recite those advantages back to us. And we included suggestions from Greenpeace about the systemic aspects of reducing single-use plastic including comprehensive policies for investing in reusable packaging and alternative delivery systems. We put forward our three specific requests. We asked for a plastics-free area or aisle, an end to price incentives for produce packed in plastic, for example, when apples are cheaper by the bag than just loose, and we asked for the option to bring our own containers for bulk goods and deli purchases. And now, if I were writing these letters now, I would add a suggestion to join the Canada Plastics Pact, which I will touch on in a minute. We collected as many signatures for these letters as we could and sent them by snail mail. So good luck with your letters. And now I want to touch on briefly the Canada Plastics Pact. And you can find that at plasticspact.ca. And I'm gonna quote a bit from their website. The Canada Plastics Pact or CPP is creating a circular economy in Canada in which plastics waste is kept in the economy and out of the environment. It is a unique, multi-stakeholder, industry-led, cross-value chain collaboration platform, which aims to tackle plastic packaging waste and pollution by bringing together businesses, government, non-governmental organizations, and other key actors in the local plastics value chain. Canada Plastics Pack partners are united, working together on achieving clear, actionable actionable targets by the year 2025. 
So some of the businesses involved included Canadian Tire Corporation, Coca-Cola Canada, Colgate Palmolive Company, Co-op Brands, General Mills, Kraft Heinz Canada, Loblaw Companies, Maple Leaf Foods, Save on Foods, Spud.ca, and Walmart. So there's a good selection of um, industries that are signed on to the pact. And supporters of the initiative include the David Suzuki Foundation, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Metro Vancouver, and the Recycling Council of British Columbia. They have four target areas by 2025. They want to define a list of plastic packaging that is to be designated as problematic or unnecessary and take measures to eliminate them. They want 100% of plastic packaging designed to be reusable, recyclable, or compostable. They are targeting 50% effectively recycled or composted plastics. And they are looking at a 30% recycled content across all plastic packaging. So that would mean that some plastic packaging is 100% recycled content and others are much less, but an average of 30%. They have four priorities and priority one is to reduce, reuse and collect, eliminate unnecessary and hard to recycle plastics, drive innovation for reuse and refill models, and innovate to prevent waste from being created in the first place, and improve collection and recycling systems. Priority two, optimize the recycling system. Packaging design standards to improve recyclability. That's important so that more of the material can actually be recycled. Investments in new infrastructure, address supply and demand issues to incorporate recycled resins, and ensure government policy is in place and is well designed. And then there is their third priority, use data to improve the whole system create standard definitions and measurement practices. And that's a huge one because there are so many players in the plastic packaging world and drive investment in better time, real, real time data and monitoring. The goals of the Plastics Pact are ambitious and we need that. The participants list is growing all the time. I keep checking back. And the supporters list is also getting longer, which is something we like to see. So check it out, plasticspact.ca. And it is an example of the cooperation and collaboration that is going to be necessary to tackle the plastics pollution crisis. And back to you, Mary. Great, thank you. And um, I think it's Vivian about reusables. Okay. Hello. Hopefully this owl thing works and that it spotlights back to me. If not, I will use my theater voice and hopefully you can all hear me. Sure. Um, thank you everybody for joining us in person on Zoom. It's very exciting for us people who are passionate about these issues to find out that others are interested and in whatever journey you are in your um, environmental journey that you are willing to learn more about it and you know commune with other people who are interested and just like I always tell people like what are even just if your reusable straw is the only thing that is part of your life that's sustainable or whether your whole trash lifestyle fits in a mason jar whatever you're doing your bit and we appreciate that so it takes a village right so hopefully um, as all the initiatives that you folks have pointed out and all the things that we do in our everyday life it all really does matter and I've seen that effect really take root and it's very inspiring as bleak as the numbers are 
it's very inspiring to see that change has started and it has already made an impact in the last like 10, 15 years of a lot of this environmentalism and awareness has happened. Um, numbers show that it has already started to make an impact. So I think if we keep going, um, the change is, uh, the change is, uh, is nigh, right? So um, in the link that um, Mary shared, there was also a link to um, a video that I made. Um, I, I focused on uh, reusables and uh, on single use plastic. And so um, I'm very passionate about that because as you know, a lot of things, it's not really about recycling. Recycling is, I like to say, it's like the last worst case scenario thing that we shouldn't really even be in a circular economy recycling to begin with. A lot of it is reuse, repair. Um, and so um, hopefully you saw the video. If not, it's part of the package. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to shout them out now or share with them in the chat. And I can gladly speak to that. But the numbers are, are very staggering because that's, I think, one of the, the worst things that is affecting us right now environmentally is um, the garbage that is from single-use uh, plastic, single-use containers, the single-use items um, is probably one of the number one um, issues affecting us right now uh, climatically because to dispose of them, even just what it takes to get them to the recycling people, when only 3% ever get recycled, is, is a lot of drain on our resources unnecessarily. Um, the plastic that has been produced since plastic was a thing in the 50s, 60s is the entire weight of humanity already. Um, and so at best case scenarios, like I said, three, four percent are being recycled and the rest is end up in landfill or in our oceans or whatever, right? And so as you all have already pointed out, there are really effective and easy solutions to single use um, by bulk, um, reuse the things that you already have. Do things at home, like DIY um, products. Shop at places that allow you to have bulk. Um, carry your mug and your bag wherever you go. You know, it's, it's one of those things that once you're aware of what you can do and you start doing it, it becomes a practice. It's really not that hard. And it goes a long way to, um, to save a lot of the single-use plastics and single-use containers in general. Yeah, Mary, let's go Mary. Um, where is kind? Cafe. Kind Cafe, good question, is on Main and 15th, Main and 16th okay. area. Yeah, good there, question. There, in her video, she talks about this wonderful cafe where they're just really doing a good job on reusing. Yeah, and actually, it's, it's interesting because a lot of restaurant owners have started spreading the word, and a lot of them, like, you know, the cafes um, on that street um, from Kind down to, like, two, three blocks north of Kind, um, she kind of went and just um, the, oh, like, some, like Samantha, the, the co-founder, she just went and said, hey, you know, I'm part of Kind Cafe and we do this reusable cup. And she just started to chat with the business owners as a fellow business owner and they started adopting the program. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of cafes now are like, they offer the program of, um, of deposits or they're more about, um, even during COVID, they were, they even had signs saying, we still take your mug if you want to bring it in. It's not, you know, so they were, um, it's, it all takes that integrative model of, of being that that beacon of examples for other businesses that it's it's very doable it's it actually saves money because she's saying the money that she's saved over all these single use down the road it's actually financially a good incentive environmentally a good incentive and a lot of customers respond very positively to the fact that 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 areas that they patron are are being part of the change so it actually works in a, in a very very wonderful circle um, what I noticed, like I do a lot of recycling, compost, and all that. What I have in the garbage, like a, a, I look at the things that, that you know, it's like the plastic bags, mm -hmm. all sorts of plastic, like the, you know, toilet paper, and uh, come in this big plastic bag. Yeah, a lot of things, uh, the clamshells and yeah. the things. Like sometimes it's uh, unless you go to the farmers market. Uh, if you just go to grocery store, a lot of the fruits and vegetables come in packaged like that, yeah. uh, individually. And uh, the plastic bags, like I try to put them together to bring to those uh, deep depots that we, they take mm -hmm. the plastic bag. But I was told that they don't really recycle those plastic bags because only certain plastic bags can mm -hmm. be recycled. Yeah. Again, just like those uh, um, um, corn starch yeah. uh, utensils, whatever. But we don't know. No, and see, a lot of it is, is what they call greenwashing in the industry. Yeah. A lot of incentives get done to, to especially oil producing companies, that if you, like 10% of your package is non-oil product, you can call it green or compostable, when it really isn't. Mm -hmm. Like compostable plastic isn't a thing. I am so peeved 
and the fact that compulsive plastic is a thing that people like even just putting those two words together compulsive plastic makes no sense it is it is not biodegradable it'll render your compost bin useless because that's plastic at the end of the day so there's a lot of greenwashing unfortunately in the industry about um and has already been mentioned about what is recyclable and compostable and not unless it, unless it's not made 100 of like a food byproduct it is not compostable um, and so a lot of things, uh, for example, I, I work at Nata, a package-free uh, bulk mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. And we were like, for, since, our, since our birth three, four years ago, we were the only bulk store like that was on that scale in Western Canada. And now there's like five. Mm -hmm. So even with the last three years, because one of the main staples of that is customers. Mm -hmm. They were ready yeah. for that kind of a model, but they didn't have where to go. A yeah. lot of them ended up going, well, only go to the farmers markets in the bulk section of my grocery store but then again it's the plastic and it was just a vicious cycle so luckily with with consumers and customers being responsible and saying they're petitioning their companies they're lobbying their cafes and they're really really um raising awareness of the fact that they're ready for that change now there's competition which because we should think stores like this should be the norm not the exception now there's some we've got there. another question for you yes please oh, marcia um, hi, I just want to thank all the presenters today and um, to say that I put in the chat that on the CBC platform, What on Earth, that you can access either, either as a podcast or listen to it on Sunday morning when many of us may be involved in church activities, but there is a podcast and also directly on the CBC website. In the last week, the last week of June, there have been many features about the upcoming federal ban on six types of plastic that will be starting uh, in the new year. So we are going to see a ban on checkout bags, cutlery, takeout wear, including uh, those, those hard to recycle uh, items, plastic aluminum can, ring carriers, stir sticks, and straws. So in the last week, what we're talking about today has been getting a lot of coverage in, in, our, um, in our government broadcaster because it is now going to become law, but it represents only 3%, as I understand it, of the bulk. But a lot of the commentators point to all, all of the uh, points that have been raised today. Um, I'd also just like for the people who live on the North Shore, and to follow up on something Barb said, we have an outlet which is on a place I normally go to in my car anyway. So I just refilled uh, the container I already have of Dr. Bronner's Castile soap, so you can take it in and they, they weigh your container and pour it directly in. So I don't have to keep buying a plastic container of Castile soap. And because I go to Edgemont Village anyway, it's one of my rounds with my granddaughter, I figure I'm not driving to make a, to make a statement about uh, saving the environment because I'm already there. And uh, I understand that the owner has also just opened a similar outlet. It's called Delish General Store in Edgemont, but she's just opened another one in Dunbar. So if that's close to you already, um, it's another way to avoid the duplication of buying more plastic to save plastic. Um, so I want to thank everyone again for um, the tips you gave us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have more questions at the end if people can stay after 1230, but we're going to keep to the agenda. We'd specifically invited people to bring questions for Vivian because we originally thought about showing the 15 minute video, but when we did the agenda, that wasn't going to work time wise. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, changing habits. Like Shelly, I get excited when I discover a new product. And I live in Kitsilino, so I've got a couple of um, shops near me that are uh, good. I've got the source, and I've got a little uh, uh, shop that where I, I first I bought my first shampoo bar, which I love. It's um, and I think part of it in changing habits is to you know be prepared to experiment a bit and find something that works for you i live alone so some of my options are easier and some are more difficult it's harder to shop in bulk when you live alone and yeah. have a 550 yeah. square foot apartment yeah. and uh, so and and also i think simplifying and i love those of you who have found ways i'm an educator by background and almost vocation and uh, so finding you know, pleasant ways, the Canadian way to educate people. And one of the early things I started doing was if I was at a restaurant 
and I ordered a beverage, whatever the beverage was, I would say, no straw, please. And if they brought me a straw, I would literally tell them to remove it, even if it was already in the drink. <laughs> and I knew that wasn't going to do any good environmentally. Uh, but I thought next time this guy hears somebody say no straw, he knows that he's going to be left with a, um, a wet plastic straw. <laughs> and, and recently, when we while our little group was discussing things, I thought, straws, like, why do we need straws? I mean, some people do, but most of us don't, right? Okay, and, and loose tea, um, I got a special teapot that has a little um, filter in it that it just, the tea goes in, when the tea's done, I dump it out and it's all easy. But today I'm going to talk about my challenge with toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> and um, some of this is because just every time I went to the drugstore and bought toilet, eight rolls of toilet paper in a plastic container, I cringed. And so I looked into, I did all sorts of research, classic for overthinkers. <laughs> of, um, you know, you can order 50 rolls of toilet paper wrapped in paper from Staples. It would take me a long time to use that. I tried to find a, a group that would share this. <laughs> and, uh, so it, and then I discovered some people use fabric for wiping themselves. Usually just for number one, not for number two, but there you go. And so uh, then again, I started doing research and people, I started, I, I would post on Facebook, people would come out of the closet as pee wipe users. <laughs> uh, I found a shop on Etsy where you could buy these beautiful rainbow colored two plied flannelettes, uh, pee wipes with uh, serger stitching all around. I considered getting a neighborhood small grant and asking a friend of mine who has a serger to do this. And I finally settled down and a friend of mine who's a sewer gave me some flannelette. And from Etsy, I discovered that four inches by six inches seems to be standard. I didn't even use pinking shears for these. I did discover that the plain colored flannelette is more absorbent than the pattern flannelette. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep this little um, basket on, on my bathtub edge, which is reachable from the toilet. <laughs> and I have this little bag on a hook near my toilet. That's where the used ones go. And when I wash them, I didn't like the idea of just shoving them all in just because it would be a problem in the wash. So when they're done and I'm ready for the wash, I put all the pee wipes in here, zip it up and shove it in the wash. And I, I shove it in the dryer and they're all dry and then they get recycled, reused into here. So uh, I'm told that some people use terry cloth. A Unitarian minister in the UK uses terry cloth. She prefers it. <laughs> I invited to her a tent and she said, well, I'll try, but with the time zone difference, it's kind of difficult. She says that she's very funny. She says, There's nothing I would love to do than talk across thousands of miles about how I wipe my butt. <laughs> so you meet interesting people talking to them too, right? And bed sheets, uh, yeah, like uh, yeah, flannel yeah. bed sheets. And I like flannel. This is brand new flannelette, but it was, it was just stored in my friend Sheila's basement. So there you go. So on the um, on the uh, eco challenge for plastic free July, as well as picking off uh, some of their goals that you want to uh, challenge yourself to, you can make your own goal. So one of my goals is to convert one person to using pee wipes. <laughs> For that person, and I can check it off. <laughs> yeah, I would like to say something here, and that's that toilet paper is uniquely Western. Uh -huh. And uh, when I was in Thailand, most most people there use a hose with uh, water yeah. to wipe themselves. Yeah. And I tried that in North America, but the damn water was just too cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, Muslims that they use water to flush themselves, yeah. uh, and uh, they find using toilet paper so dirty. Yeah. If you're if you're on uh, Facebook, there's a I've watched Zero Waste Vancouver go from three thousand to seven thousand to something like thirteen thousand people, and those people love to help you solve your zero waste problems. So there's people on there talking about eBay's and different options, etc. 
So we're almost at uh, 1.30. If um, we have a couple of minutes to have a couple of people say something they learned today, or especially if there's something that you are inspired to do, I'd love to hear you check in and say that. Okay, one other thing. Oh, and, 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 sorry, Adam, you've already chatted, Ben. I'm going to look for some other people. 30 se 10 seconds. No. <laughs> okay. In Thailand, I got a recyclable straw made of metal. And while it sounds great, it was too damn dangerous. Yeah. Great, thank you. Somebody else, something you learned or something you're going to do? So I'm. Um, Lily and then Elizabeth. Sorry? Lily and then Elizabeth, are you both had your hands up? Just a, an option. Um, I'm collecting um, socks for the homeless or the uh, needy people. I know you guys are doing your clothes. Not aware that they need socks desperately. And so, any socks, any size, any season, even they don't match color lines, even they are symbols, because they will match it. Thank it you. doesn't matter awesome. what it is, maybe blue or black. Super, thank you. And so, you can uh, drop it. I I'm collecting it all yeah. around. All right, thank Here. you. Yeah. Elizabeth, bring it to Sunday. Uh, especially around COVID 19, a lot of people went and got dogs and cats. Oh. To themselves and I'm cat sitting right now with a whole bunch of little plastic blood mm -hmm. uh, bags mm -hmm. from the feces and the urine. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's seemed right to put it in the garbage and in my sink. So you, you have, so your question is what to do? Well yeah. only speak I'm only one and I'm only doing it for like a, a month. And there's when I go to see people in our park, there's lots of dogs and lots of food mm. <laughs> and lots of plastic. My understanding it has to go in the garbage. I put it in the toilet. I just oh, pull yeah. it out the bag and put it in the toilet. Oh, yeah, I have that. that including the grass. I think that's probably a thing too. Unless it's just granular. Right. Yeah, I've heard that flushing is not the best because it goes into the same system where a lot of things, I don't know, there's something yeah. about animal feces and animal urine that is a little, little bit process. worse. Cats than, especially. The cats that is a little bit worse than human mm -hmm. feces yeah. or urine, which so can actually know. contaminate more systems than people think. There's something for that. So I, I would read up on it because mm -hmm. I heard something controversial on that. So yeah, just be yeah, careful. So our Metro Vancouver mm -hmm. Zero Waste team meets once a month and we love to chew into these discussions yes. and controversies yeah. and we'll make sure that we research it and get back to folks. And there are some natural products for cats. Like there's the walnut, right? Mm -hmm. The walnut. Okay, so we're at 1.30. Thank you all for attending, especially those of you who did a presentation today. And um, as mentioned, I will circulate the information uh, to those who attended. And um, yeah, look forward to hearing back from you what changes you make. And we might see you on the Eco Challenge site. All right, everybody. Thanks, Mary. <laughs>